tonight, we are joined by two of our gallery artists, David Emmett Adams and Jamie Stillings in honor of our current exhibition. So I'm gonna start off by showing some pictures of our current exhibition in case everybody hasn't had the chance to come by and see it. So these installation photographs are by Jamie Stillings. We're looking at 55 gallon steel oil drum lids with a uh, wet plate collodion by David Emmett Adams on that back wall. You also see them behind me. And then we have Jamie Stillings color aerial photographs from Chile. He's looking at renewable energy and historic mining, also in a high, high desert like New Mexico. And we're going to start tonight by having both David and Jamie tell us a little bit more about the work. Quick little five minute thing just to provide a little bit of context there. So, David, we decided you were going first. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to see you all. I'm starting this brief presentation with two photographs that reveal a bit of my working methods for the ongoing series power. For those that aren't familiar, I use an 1850s photographic process called wet plate collodion to make photographs directly onto 55 gallon oil drum lids. This is an in-camera process, so I built the camera you see here to fit these lids. The back of the camera detaches and holds a sensitized 55 gallon drum lid. Here you see me coating the lid with collodion. Collodion is cotton that has been dissolved in alcohol and ether, hence the respirator. After coating, I submerge the plate in a bath of silver nitrate, which makes the plate sensitive to light. From here, it goes into a plate holder and attaches back onto the camera that you saw in the last slide. The composed seam is projected through the lens and onto the sensitized drum lid. It is then developed immediately on site in my portable darkroom. This image here is one of the first images I made for this project at the Navajo refinery in Artesia, New Mexico. This photograph and the following were commissioned by the Ogden Museum in New Orleans and were part of their new Southern Photography exhibition. The commission allowed me to travel with my portable darkroom and make work throughout Texas and Louisiana. Both these photographs were made in Corpus Christi, Texas. The rest of the work I'm going to show you was made in Los Angeles, California, which is the closest and largest oil producer to where I live in Phoenix. So it has been more accessible to me than the rest of the country. I love the brutalist architecture of this power plant. This photograph was made in Williamton and shows the Phillips 66 refinery and the neighborhood that surrounds it. You'll see that this series of photographs is intertwined between focusing solely on the industrial complexes and showing the industry's interaction with the community at large. This is a photograph made behind a Home Depot and shopping center. Oil production takes place in all demographics and neighborhoods in Los Angeles, including Beverly Hills, although there it is hidden behind a building facade. This tintype is a Valero asphalt plant in Los Angeles. And this one is of someone's backyard on Signal Hill. This is the last photograph I want to talk about this evening. And it is the only one in the series that is not titled based on a location and corporation. This one is titled The Hand of Man, which is an homage to this photograph made by Alfred Stieglitz of the same name. Here you see a coal-powered steam train in the train yard bellowing coal smoke. Made in 1902 during the rise of industrialized America, 
I consider the sublime. The awe and terror Stieglitz must have felt making this image, and I wanted to draw a parallel between the experience of the sublime in these works. I wonder whether Stieglitz felt this was an incredible invention or a terrible future devastation. I felt the symbolism in this piece was potent and lined up perfectly to deepen this conversation. I made this image with just enough time before the tractor trailer with the U.S. connection written on the side of it began to move out of frame. Above the tractor trailer is the American flag, shown backwards as a result of the direct positive process. Beneath the flag, a small triangle of pipes, for me, represented a much larger idea a nod to another technological feat of humanity, the Great Pyramids. With this in mind, I reattach that photograph on top of a stack of 55-gallon drums, stacked, as you can see, in a pyramid form. This piece has been shown at the Phoenix Art Museum and the Candela Gallery in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you very much for your time. Jamie, let's, let's hear your, your five minutes. All right. One of the wonderful things about the last couple of weeks in collaboration with PhotoEye is that in October, a book that I've been working on for several years was finally published in the United States, Atacama, Renewable Energy and Mining in the High Desert of Chile. This is the, the latest chapter in a project that I began in 2010, which has taken the overarching name of Changing Perspectives. And the intent of the project is to look at renewable energy in the landscape and use it as a, a means of interpreting the landscape, of informing ourselves, drawing connections between art and science. And each project has had its own specific uh, rationale to it. Uh, the rationale for Atacama, Renewable Energy and Mining in the High Desert of Chile is exactly that that over the past eight or so years, as the price of renewable energy dropped below that of coal energy production, the Atacama with its tremendous wind and solar potential has become a place to build large amounts of renewable energy. And the mining industry there, it's the largest copper exporter in the world and the second largest lithium exporter in the world, is a ready customer for that renewable energy. So what you have found is a transition by most of the major mines away from energy that was traditionally produced by coal, diesel, and liquefied natural gas to renewable energy. And so my goal was to really look at the mining industry itself, to look at renewable energy, and to see how these tie, to, tie together and then bring that information together within the context of either articles or a book. And so this work was completed in 2017, and the book was put together, designed by David Chickey, but to be published by Gerhard Steidel, Steidel blog in Germany. Well, something happened. The book got in, uh, in, in December 2020. There was something happening in 2020. I don't know what it was. It was a pandemic or something. And the end result was that the book kept getting pushed out and pushed out. So finally, this year, in March, we printed, and in July, it was back from the bindery, and that became the finished book. Now, in that interim, what happened was Chile tripled its renewable energy capacity over that five-year period. And so last year, just about a year ago, I went back and I decided to shoot an entire new round of work. And, and so this work, as I'm able to exhibit it, will, will be alongside the work from 2017. But uh, because of all the complexities of publishing a book, the book itself is all work from 2017, not from 2017 and 2022. So again, I'm revisiting brand new solar and wind projects, I am looking at different mines that I was able to access before. We're collecting information on which mines have made the transition or in the process of making the transition. And for instance, you saw this concentrated solar project. 
under construction actually at a pause in construction in 2017. And here it is in 2022 making power. And, and so it also meant that I continued a certain exploration. The way that I tried to shoot is that I allow myself to go between the informational side or what I call the narrative side and the aesthetic side or even the even the metaphoric side. And I and I want myself after after having done a lot of research about a topic and have really learned the area through Google Maps and other satellite photographs, that once I'm there, I'm actually able to just see and and use what I'm doing to interpret the landscape. This project, both in 2017 and in 2022, is all from a small airplane, two, two different Cessnas, two different sizes of Cessnas. In the United States, I love to photograph from a helicopter. Most of the time, I am quite a ways up in the air. Uh, but just for cost factors and distance factors, cost being the predominant one, uh, I needed to work out of an airplane for this project. So this gives you a, just a sampling of that. And with that, I think I've hit my five minute mark. So there we go. And I will jump out of here. Out of the screen share, that is. You cannot leave yet. No, I'm not leaving yet. I'm not leaving yet. <laughs> and Jamie, so your recent projects, you're, you're shooting from above. A lot of people ask me if you're photographing with a drone and I know, I know you are not. T tell us about the the flying portion of it. When I started this, of course, there were lots of very well recognized, there was a history of aerial photography that really started when photography started. So, but that has traditionally been from first hot air balloons and then airplanes and then helicopters. And so when I joined that group of people working in that, it was not a new way to work. In fact, you know, one of the one of the fun things for me was when I was learning about the history of aerial photography. Somebody said, "Are you familiar with the work of William uh, William Garnett?" And I said, "No." And then immediately went out to find out about him. And well, William Garnett had his first solo exhibition in the George Eastman Museum in 1955, the year that I was born. So, at any rate, back to why I do what. Drones are amazing, and they have opened the the medium of photography to you know millions of people. They work really well for cinema, and they work really well from ground level, several hundred feet. You know, technically, you're supposed to only go up 400 feet above the the ground in the states, but you can make decisions to go higher than that. But hopefully, I'll never hit a drone up at an elevation where helicopters or planes should fly. Helicopters can go from the ground up to several thousand feet in the air. I probably never worked more than about 6,000 feet over a subject. And really a lot of what happens is the atmospheric haze and the sense of kind of connection diminishes if you get up very, very high. And then an airplane, you're never gonna go below 1,000 or 1,500 feet. And so there's this overlapping sense of space. The, the airplane allows me to travel very long distances and really look at a wide range of subjects. And in, in the Atacama, it was perfect for that because I could move from one topic to another very quickly. That's 50 miles away, I can be over there in you know 30 minutes and I can be over the top of that and photograph that. A helicopter, unfortunately in the Atacama would have been about five times more expensive than the airplane. It was totally beyond my ability to do that. The helicopter is wonderful because the instrument panel is low. Typically you have, I have my door off and I just have this amazing view of what's going on in the, around the world uh, below me. Uh, I can really move my, my camera out to move a lot of different directions where I'm more constrained in an airplane because the window is open on the door and that's it. What, what it means in both cases though, but especially a helicopter is you can go up thinking that you're gonna photograph something this way and you get up there and you go, no, actually, over here is better. Circling around something in a helicopter or in an airplane reveals a whole range of options visually that are intriguing that are much harder to do in a drone. A drone, you're, you're looking at the thing that you think is the perfect view, but you can't go over there and go like, whoa, look at that. You know, and so it's a very different process. I actually 
say that photographing from either a helicopter or an airplane is more like street photography to me because I'm, I'm making decisions very quickly. I tend to frame things exactly how I want them. So if I'm making a tight circle with the pilot of the airplane or the helicopter, I'm framing, reframing, framing, moving in, moving out to try to create the image that I want. With a drone, on, on still photography anyway, I'm framing it just the way I want and then it's click and you kind of go like, oh, wait a minute, am I done? I just see them as very different tools. They complement each other. But clearly, the drone is, is the most affordable thing for most people to get themselves up in the air. And David, you have a darkroom truck. Yes. Right? You want to tell us about the darkroom truck? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's essentially what it is. It is a, it's a box truck. And in the back of it, is, I have a portable darkroom where it, that allows me to, you know, get on the road and travel around and make these photographs. One of the things that I love is like, we're like, I think our work looks great on the wall together as a point counterpoint, but our processes couldn't be different. You know, David is using a physical material from the industrial world to create a plate and it's one frame at a time, very laborious. And I'm got a camera that is, that is a digital capture, a hundred megapixel. I've got a dual axis gyroscope on it. And I am moving very quickly to see, to frame and reframe. And then my images emerge from that digital world to create prints and which are, which can be replicated, you know, as multiple originals, whereas David's is one of a kind off of that one drum lid or what, what, whichever me size he's happening to work with. I just, I just think it's interesting how differently we work, yet we still feel comfortable together on the wall. Yeah, and this is actually our, our second show together. Um, and I do think, you know, the conversation is the same. We're, we're similar in, in very similar ways. I, I'm kind of curious to ask you, Jamie, if you've, if one of the things you brought up, one of the things you mentioned was that you, because of access, you weren't able to do a portion of what your original idea was. So you, you know, bounced forward and, or moved forward and, you know, went, went to the air for it. But I'm curious, has this been a common thread? Meaning being that have you run into situations where you've got denied access? Or are you a person that asks for forgiveness? Or do you ask for permission? Uh, it's a good question. It, it is very different from one country to another. Okay, so the control of airspace is what is what really makes a difference. An example of that is a, a, a magazine assignment for a New York Times magazine. They wanted me to shoot over the Supermax, the highest secure federal prison in the country. And the reality is the airspace over the Supermax is public airspace. I can fly over it without asking permission. I chose to inform the prison system because I didn't want them to think I was trying to foist you know, an escape on people. But in Chile, we had several areas that were controlled by the military. And if they were doing exercises or things like that, then there was no way I was going to get on. Or they would ask us to do a very specific plan. And that plan would be, you know, the timing, where we're going to be, where we're going to enter the airspace and exit the airspace. And then they would say yes or no. In Japan, we had heliports that we wanted to take off of, but we couldn't take off until nine o'clock or 930 in the morning. And the sun was coming up at 530. So the helicopter people, in one case, an abandoned tennis court near a love hotel that we could take off anytime we wanted to, to get out and do the early morning work. So it, it, I think it really, I don't, I don't do anything illegal, but I do have to work ar around a lot of different kinds of regulations. Yeah, interesting. So, so I've got a, I've got a question for you, David, and I, I think the same could, you could turn it back around on me in a certain extent. Um, do you feel liberated or constrained by how successful you become at doing a project that require is very labor intensive and very slow in the way it works? Both. Yeah. Making them feels amazing. Getting to the process and the point of making them is, is very difficult, both financially and you know, timing wise, as far as, you know, being able to fit in this process, I, I know I could photograph, you know, the entire project 
in a matter of a year if I had the the freedom and the the you know finances to do so. But it, it, in my current situation, my case is that not that. So it, it is both. <laughs> both. I mean, I feel I feel really encouraged to make the work, but also I feel constrained by you know the the time the time it takes you know the the process itself it, it if you're standing in front of these in person they're insanely sharp they're razor sharp and i think it's it's one of the reasons that this process is is so intriguing to me because it's it, it's sharper than you know anything else photographically goes i mean daguerreotypes are very sharp but they're at a point hard to see these are sharp in a way that is illuminating. I will say we've had a lot of people come into the gallery that are very familiar with wet plate and have been particularly impressed just how sharp these are in particular. So yes, if anybody's around in Santa Fe, going to be in Santa Fe through January 6th, definitely come by and take a look at these. David, when was the last time you took a square or rectangular photograph? Oh, I mean, I believe it or not, I shoot digitally. <laughs> I do have, uh, you know, one of my favorite cameras is F3 Nikon film camera. So, I mean, I, I shoot all the time. You know, my phone is, I use it every day. It, it records my life. Anything I see and everything I see, is it's right there. And, you know, I have other projects as well that I work on that, you know, aren't as time consuming and are freeing in a sense that if, I need to uh, get that immediate urge, right, to to make art, to create a photograph. I can go into my dark room and I can explore, you know, cameraless work or whatever the case may be. Um, so, yeah, often. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But I know a lot of my things end up being around, even even you know the work from conversations with histories on you know objects and cans that you know I, I find in the desert, and a lot of that end up, ends up being around as well. well I love the, I love round images, so no problem there. Do you have anything that you were like dying to know, David? If like being up in the air and that kind of stuff, is there anything that you, intrigues you about that other than? I refuse to give you my secrets about how to do wet collodion from a helicopter. I was going to ask your your secrets of, you know, funding and coming up with, you know, project after project. You seem, you know, obviously prolific in your in your way of, you know, moving forward. Well, I think that's a moving target. It's been a moving target for a long time. Most of the time it's required legal gambling. And I don't mean the gambling kind of gamble, but... It often has been trying to find a way to make something work when there's not an easy solution to it. The bridge project, I went out on a limb during the Great Recession. Esh was super supportive of it, but I had to borrow money out of a of, of retirement account and stuff like that to kind of get the thing going and doing what I wanted to do. I was able to get a letter of assignment for the New York Times Magazine to start the project, and that gave me access and understanding of the permissions required to do what I wanted to do. When that article came out, I was able to convince them to let me continue the project for the next two years as a personal project. And so the, the gamble ended up being that by the time the exhibition was on the walls of the Phoenix Art Museum and Israeli had printed the bridge book, I broke even on the project. And that's a complicated process, but it was collections, print sales, editorial licensing, you know, everything in the world to make it happen. And based on that, I gambled on the Ivanpah project when I got essentially lost the access on the ground, which have been a very inexpensive way <laughs> to document. I basically calculated what it would take to document the project right. And I made a commitment, which was a financial commitment that was, you know, was going to, that was going to cost about $25,000 to do it. And I said, I'm going to try to make this happen. Now I have a commercial side of my life that I can use to help support that, but I'm also looking to get fundraising and that kind of thing. And what typically happens happened with that one, three years into the project, everybody starts to go like, oh, this guy's been documenting this thing forever. And then all of a sudden, everybody's interested in it. So again, by the end of that project, the Library of Congress had collected a portfolio of prints. 
the corporations that were involved with the project had licensed images and I was net positive cash flow. So sometimes I can do that. What I found is it's easier. It's been easier to do that domestically and it has not been easy to do it with the international projects I've done. So I am actually in the process of working on developing a different way to try to raise funds through grants and individual and foundation and, and corporate donations, because the only way that I can really focus more intensely on these projects is to find funding sources from people who believe in the value of what I'm trying to do. I mean, you make, I think, yeah. a compromise too, right? You teach. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Right? So you have a day job like I have a day job. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And then you find the way to work around that and you rob Peter to pay Paul. And, and as it goes, I thought you had some sort of secret, but no. Yeah, we're. I we're, do not have a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, David, you have made it a goal to photograph how many locations in the United States? Well, that's the thing. I have them. I have them all mapped out. There's 147. I'm not sure that is my necessarily my goal, but it is, you know, it is there and it is that looming idea. Ultimately, you know, I I would like to have enough to uh, make a book and and go that route with this work and move it around as a as an exhibition. Uh, so how many does that entail? I'm not sure, but I don't believe it's 147. You know, I mean, like you don't need 147 photographs to illustrate the idea. I just, I just like the idea of this uh, project um, documenting the entirety of the oil refineries within the United States, because I, I have hopes and beliefs that, you know, this, everything that we're looking at in these images will change someday. Uh, and and th these two will be, you know, technology of the past. And so I find importance in that, and I and I I like the idea of it. I think you have a similar alignment to me that you're hoping that the work that you're doing engages in the contemporary conversations about climate change and industrialization, but you're also hoping to have it have an historical component to it. Is that that I yeah. mean, both of us are both of us hope that the work may have some merit and value beyond that. So we have a question. So questions from anybody, throw them into the, the chat. We have one from Edward right now. He uh, So this is for both of you. Is there anything that excites or fascinates you about photography right now, even in your own other projects and anything that worries you? That's a great question. Who wants to start? Go ahead, Jamie. I'll start with what worries me. I, I'm, I'm, I think that AI is a fun play tool, but I really have a hard time with it right now. I just see a whole lot of stuff that to me is like Neo thirties, black and white. And I, there's something about it. The notion of, of putting in multiple words and, and, and then manipulating those to get to an image that is essentially a composite of all the images scraped off the internet is just weird to me. I don't can't see myself as a creator in that process. So I just don't really have an interest in it. But it worries me because I do think it's going to radically impact everything we do. I already see myself responding to images very, very differently in the last year than I did a year before. Do you wonder if they're AI generated? Every my I question the veracity of images all the time. Maybe before you were thinking it was Photoshop. Well, I but Photoshop I knew and like if it's a conceptual image, you kind of accepted the fiction and all of that. But now there are lots of other things where the lines get blurred in a lot of different ways. And so if you don't have a kind of a label that lets you know that it's photo illustration or that it's AI generated, um, then you're forced into this 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 world where you question it. And I think that we're all there. Yeah. From the art, the art perspective, the art point of view, I think it's a tool for artists to use and experiment with and, and you know, push the medium forward from a, a worried standpoint. Yeah. It can be, it can be terrifying to think about what will be faked 
and that is what is already being faked and you know you know images are language and people believe them immediately so it can be quite quite terrifying but also very interesting so on the other side of the question what are you guys excited about we have excitement and fear what's the excitement <laughs> Now you have to start, David. I'm an educator and I, I get inspired by my my students and excited about what their their reflections are because they're from, you know, they're from different generation. And I teach, you know, from the beginning of photography to to digital. And everyone comes in with whatever class it is, comes in with their own perspectives. And, you know, you feed them some information and they come back with, you know, what is now. And that excites me to see a reflection of, you know, the, the immediacy of what's taking place. That inspires me and that excites me. I, I, I like to look at images. I like to read the images. And I, and I like when my students bring in, bring in things that I hadn't considered or hadn't seen yet. David, have many of your students gotten into wet plate collodion or other vintage processes? Yeah, I teach historic photo processes. So yeah, absolutely. But in terms of like, they they learned it and they've incorporated it as a long into their practice. practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. practice. That's yeah. cool. Having been teaching for 10, 10 years now, it's it's really cool to see the people that have stuck with it. You know, the students that you know, I was their first photo one teacher or whatever the case may be, and now they have their own photo practice and their own photo business or whatever the case may be. You know, it's like yeah, it's rewarding and it's exciting about you, Jamie? What are you excited about? You know, I, I think it's interesting. I am really excited to discover fellow artists' work. And, and I, in particular, am trying to emphasize that I communicate my appreciation to them. Uh, one of the more recent examples was uh, an aerial photographer, Polish aerial photographer, Kasper Kowalski. And I had known his work for quite a while. I really liked it a lot. And he won an, IP, an IPA book award, International Photography Awards. He, he won a book award. And I said, you know, I'm just going to write him. And so I wrote him and I said, you know, I know a lot of aerial photographers. I'm an aerial photographer. I think you might be one, one of my favorite, if not my favorite aerial photographer. And then we, you know, we set up a Zoom and we talked for two hours about photography and philosophy and, and plagiarism and all sorts of things. But there's something about discovering somebody going in their own particular exploratory path that I find invigorating. And it brings me back to my work with energy, not to emulate them, but just to kind of work to keep myself fresh and to think about different ways to move forward with new work. That's awesome. So I am I am curious, David, as an educator, do you find that you're you learn a lot from your students? And not into the sense of it has influenced my artistic practice, but you know they always have interesting things to say. I just want to ask a quick one that relates to that. Do you share your practice with your students, or do you keep your practice separate from your students teaching your students? I I always share it with them. Like I always you know throughout the semester. I give us a, a slide lecture at some point. And then, you know, if I'm teaching historic photo processes, it's, it comes quicker, right? But yes, yeah, so now I, I, I let them know. So if anybody else has any other questions, throw them in the chat, but I'm gonna ask one more question. Oh wait, we have one. Do either of you have new projects in the work or on the horizon? or subjects that you are exploring? It's a very good question. Jamie, first. Well, it's a leading question. It was a little bit like, you know, Hannity for photographers. <laughs> the answer um, is always yes. The answer yes. is always yes. I am have been researching, working on a project that would make the Atacama project seem relatively modest in comparison. I, I would like to do an extensive project on renewable energy in Australia. Australia has a whole bunch of interesting things going on from the fact that it's the largest coal, iron, I think gold, lithium exporter in the world. 
might not be first in gold. And so, but a whole different set of circumstances for that industrial side. And then it is doing very interesting things on the, on the domestic, residential, urban side of things. And then there are also a couple of billionaires that don't get along terribly well together there, but are very committed to renewable energy and to green hydrogen. And I think that they have the potential to really move the mark, not only in Australia, but globally. And so I, I'm really looking forward to taking that project on. If you do this work, how many trips do you have to make to Australia? Or are you like stay there for an extended period of time and try to get it done within that realm? I would think that an initial survey project, a survey trip that might involve very little photography, that would be a couple of weeks long. And then probably a few trips that are about a month long. And they probably will happen over, over a period of a couple of years. So yeah. in all likelihood, if I were to able to get an initial survey trip in, in 2024 done, probably, you know, 24, 25, 26, hopefully have the work done by 26. So yeah, I mean, it's extensive. And and just like you said, <laughs> uh, funding is like a huge piece of this. There's both the reality of earning a living and, and a household and kids that are in college or one that's in college and one that will be. But there's also, it's, it's, it's expensive to do a project that has a significant aerial component and travel to it. And so if funding is abundant, I'm going to always use it wisely, but if funding is abundant, I can move much more quickly on a project. If funding is not there, then I have to figure out how to make it work and that will go more incrementally. So, I mean, there's, you know, we just have this pragmatic side. So, Jamie, <laughs> you know, you have to be somewhere in four minutes. So before you go, Jamie, real quick, do you have any advice for, for other photographers that are looking to, to springboard a new project? I think sort out that which you are passionate about from that which you like, from that which you think you should do. Put the that which you think you should do on the side and work on the thing you're passionate about. And if you have time and energy left, work on the things that you really would like to do. But I think it's it's about really focusing in on and getting real with yourself about what your passion is and what you want to move forward on. Make time and space for that. Can't top that. That that's the answer. There are a couple of good questions in there for David. So so go for it, and I'll catch up with you later. Thank you very much. All right. So so David, this one specifically for you. Is there any moment? Hold on. Is there any moment in photography's past you wish you could time travel to? <laughs> that's a great question. That is that's that's a fun one. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So I take a group of, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to teach a study abroad program with the University of Kansas. And I take a group of students to go study the origins of photography. We go to France and England and we, we get to go to, you know, all the museums and then take them to specific places like Lake Hawk Abbey, where William Henry Fox Talbot, you know, made his first photographs. And so that is my time travel. I get to go do these things and, you know, pay homage to the past. But if I photographically, I've always been interested in surrealist work. So I would probably time travel to that period of time and, and hang out with Man Ray and, and do some cool stuff that way. Maybe that'll happen technology wise. And, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like that. All right. That was a nice question. Yeah, that was great. That, that, that was, that was our friend Edward again. Good questions. Ed, we appreciate you. And and you don't have anything to add to, to Jamie's response of advice for photographers and starting new projects. It was a good answer. So you know, for for me, for me, my projects have they kind of come off of each other. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask Jamie, because I think that's probably relevant to what his practice is too. You know, it's it's one as you're working through the project, you might have made a photograph that doesn't fit within the the constraints of your original idea, and that could easily be branched off and become a whole new project. And that's that's what's taking place in my work. That's what's take, had taken place in the past. And so, 
I think staying true to your your ideas and and who you are is most important. Not moving to just do what is the hot new thing and and just kind of practice on being yourself in photography and and stick stick true to who you are and and it'll just kind of come naturally, I believe anyway. Or or to have the 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 longevity to want to keep pushing it that far you you kind well, of Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the that's the that's a really hard part. That's a hard part about being an artist. It's hard about be, being a photographer or anyone really that's choosing the the life of, you know, what they're passionate about um is the longevity you just you have to push through the the low moments so you can get back to the high moments and and it, it's part of it well said well thank you david thank you yeah absolutely thank my you. pleasure Thanks for everybody for joining us and have a great night